Good evening, folks. Hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us once again on our Wednesday evening Bible studies. Um, a couple of little announcements real quick. Many of you know I am going to be heading overseas next week. So we're actually going to put a pause on these Bible studies for a season uh, while I'm away. I'm going to be away actually for two months um, over in Ghana. So for those of you who didn't know, you can keep me in prayer. I'm pretty excited about this trip. The, um, but for those who are around and those who tune in regularly, we may do some meetings. Um, for example, I've got, uh, I'm going to be there with Brother Lawrence in Ghana. We're going to be meeting with other um, African ministers in different places. So we may do some reports. We may do some different things. So we've got a time difference relative to you folks over here in the U.S. Uh, it's about four hours ahead for those of you on the East Coast and six hours for those out in mountain time and the like. So uh, just stay tuned. We'll try to circulate something and you can come up and join us on those things if you want to hear what's going on and meet some of the African brethren. Yes, Rick. Uh, if those watching, um, if they follow us on Facebook, they follow the ministry pages, then when something happens, they'll get a notification. So if they follow us and, and opt for those notifications, um, then when we start something, a live thing, or we even post, post something, they'll get notified of that event. So if we know ahead of time what's going on with your schedule and can schedule something out, we can let everybody know. If All they need to do is be, be uh, following our pages and, and, and opt in to be notified and they'll get a notification. So it's very easy. That's the whole point of the social media stuff. It's very easy to actually know when something's happening if as long as you just follow and, and opt in to be notified. Well, there you go. We just needed our social media guru, Mr. Rick Utzler, to step in and tell us what I'm an idiot about. So praise God. Thanks, Rick. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll be doing some things and hopefully we'll be able to share some of what's going on over there in Ghana. And it may be that we, I travel to a couple other countries as well. So uh, something to keep in prayer. Um, we're going to continue tonight, though, on our study of offerings and Christian giving generally. Uh, I always get kind of stuck in these things because I just want to bring it to a conclusion. But the fact of the matter is these are big subjects, and there's a lot of significant material that is very relevant to each of us because the people in the Scripture went through many of the same things we go through. And you can see it. So we're going to talk a little bit today about some practical examples of offerings. Um, some of the ones we're going to hit on, hopefully, we're going to go back and start with Moses and the children of Israel in the desert. It's a very useful story. Uh, and it was an example, in contrast to most of the rest of their lives, of the children of Israel under Moses actually being very faithful. And it's something that you see often in a Christian's walk, uh, in the early stages of their walk, when things are all exciting and everything's going great, and they see just the hand of the Lord moving everywhere, much like what happens with a little child when they're born. The parents are there all the time, and they're around them all the time and taking care of all their things. And it's just like, wow, 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 isn't dad cool or isn't mom cool? And then as you begin to grow up and you have to accept some responsibility, mom and dad don't become so cool anymore. Now they become a pain in the you know what. And now, well, what do I need them for anyways? And just every other stupid thing that we as people go through, well, you know what? So do the people in the scripture and you can see it. And uh, we're also going to hopefully hit on some other times when Israel was going through much tougher times. Um, one really good example that we hope to hit on tonight is when Israel is coming back out of captivity to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to do these things, because when they came back, it was way harder than when they were operating under Moses that first time. I mean, way, way harder. And a lot of people who've been around for some years know this experience personally, and that is when you receive the Lord and you're going forward, if you continue, I mean, gosh, it's uh, 
uh, you you run into difficult things and stuff like that. But if you're addressing them the first time through, it's a lot easier. What happens is when you got to go back and deal with things sometimes from years ago or having departed on different ways, it can be a lot harder to overcome the same thing that God made it pretty easy for you to overcome up front. And you see that kind of example very much playing out with the children of Israel returning from the captivity under Nehemiah and Ezra. So uh, why don't we start with uh, Exodus? And we will go over here to Exodus. Where do we want to change? Well, actually, before we go to Exodus, can one of you guys, as we're looking, and I'd put some different things in here out of Exodus uh, in the materials previously. Um, one section was Exodus 25, 1 to 9, where God's commanding Moses to take up the offering. Another is in Exodus 31. So, Rick, why don't you turn to 25? Uh, Phil, why don't you return to turn to Exodus 31? And Robin, why don't you turn to Exodus 35? And we'll come back to those. For now, I'll turn to Leviticus chapter 1. Just going to read to you a few verses at the beginning of Leviticus. And the reason is, is Leviticus is a book that's all about the priestly duties, essentially. And they're having to receive the offerings and the like from the people and what's expected of the people and all of these things. And it's very interesting to me in Leviticus chapter one, the first few verses, how he establishes a fundamental principle throughout. And I don't want anybody out here listening to lose sight of this fundamental principle, because this is everything in Christ. Christ does not expect, will not make you do things contrary to your will. That's why people go to hell, by the way. He would all men to be saved, but that doesn't mean all men will be saved because he honors your free will. So in Leviticus 1, it says, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. So basically perfect. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord of his own voluntary will. When we went through over in the book of Acts about how the people came and brought and they, and they sold properties and things like that and brought to the apostles and distribution was made such that nobody lacked for anything, but they had all things common. All of that was done purely at their own voluntary will. You don't even see a commandment going forth to do any of that. This is the people's response to the extraordinary salvation of God unto them, is they just wanted to give. They were moved to give. They desired. They didn't, the things of this world did not matter anymore compared to him. And so they just of their own voluntary free will did these things. And you see Paul all the time talking about how the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. And it talks about being a liberal giver, a liberal soul. That doesn't mean you vote democratic. It means you're a person who's given to um, supplying these different things. You're, you're given to the things of the Lord, and therefore you give abundantly to the things of the Lord. And uh, so that's the context in which that comes up. And God will, it says, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that sows liberally shall uh, reap abundantly. Okay, that's how it works. That's the law of sowing and reaping that the scripture says. So, Rick, did I have you go to the uh, first one there over in Exodus? Yes, 20, uh, 25, 1 through 9. Yeah, 25, 1 to 9. Take us there, bro. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall, make, 
you Wait, what was that they're going to give how? Willingly with his heart. So we now have two or more witnesses establishing that principle right up front this evening. Right. Go ahead. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and purple, excuse me, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin, skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. Where are your boys, Steve? Uh, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. All right, stop right there. So God's very specific, is he not here? If anyone that thinks God doesn't look at the details needs to read this, this whole, this whole thing. Well, if you read like Exodus from about 20 to 40 something or whatever, it's all about this kind of stuff. And I mean, he's getting down how he wants every single thing done, every joint, every single element of this. God lays out in detail and then he expects that Moses will see to it that it is entirely done in accordance with the pattern of what he had seen in the heavenly. Okay, he expects him to have been met, seen it one time and to do it exactly as it was shown. So now we're going to turn to Brother Phil, who's over in uh, Exodus 31. Steve. You grab the mic there, bro. Steve. And, uh, oops, hang on. Yes. I, I just wanted to mention when you said that about the temple, because um, from the baptism studies and, and um, having a place in the body of Christ in the kingdom of God, it's really no different because God lays out exactly his way, if you will. And um, it's the same thing, um, but in a different uh, context. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. God gets very specific and he expects you to be follow his instructions perfectly. So go ahead, uh, Phil, from 31. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with, with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. Stop right there for a moment. You know, Rick, you'll know this story well. Um, Brother Davey, who many of the folks in the fellowship obviously all knew well, uh, when he came to the Lord, he uh, initially, God placed him under a great minister. He was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian by the name of H. Richard Hall. H. Richard Hall would have been a, one of the kind of great tent revivalists of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and I believe into the 80s at any rate, and maybe even into the 90s. And uh, he would have been with him back in the 70s. And Brother Hall's organ player, if I remember the story correctly, and you can correct me, Rob or Rick, if, if I'm getting off on it. But Brother Hall was just walking through a town one day. And he turns and he looks at a guy. And he says, you. He said, uh, he said, you're come with me. You're playing the organ in the tent tonight. And the guy had never played the piano, organ, anything like that ever in his life. But from that night forward, he was with Brother Hall for like the rest of his ministry. I mean, for decades, I believe, playing organ for Brother Hall every night because God filled him with the wisdom he had need of. He didn't go to school for it. He didn't go training for music ministry. God just put it in him. And I want you to understand when he's saying he's put these things in this guy, that's what he's talking about. It doesn't mean this guy's ever done these things before. But it mean, and he's working in wood, he's working in metal, he's working in stones, he's working in all sorts of things. 
that's extraordinary. And then to be able to carry out with precision everything that God has told Moses to do is extraordinary. And that's what he's saying. He's called this guy by name and he's put his spirit in him with the wisdom to do this stuff. You can keep reading. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamech, of the tribe of Dan, and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee, the tabernacle of the congregation, and the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is thereupon, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, and the table, and its furniture, and the pure candlestick with all his furniture, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all his furniture, and the laver and his foot, and the cl cloths of the service, and the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his son to minister in the priest's office, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. So, and yep, that's you can stop right there. So with this one guy who he's put in wisdom for all these things, he's also given him what a holy ab. Um, and in addition to a holy ab, so he's got two guys now, in addition to him, and he's also in the hearts of all that are wise hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. So he's also put in others. And what's going to happen here is they have not seen the vision. Moses has. And what God has shown Moses, he's going to tell them to do. And if you remember, it's all written out in detail. I mean, it'd be like a written blueprint, essentially, is what Moses gives. And he puts that up there. And he's going to then expect these guys to make it exactly in accordance with what God has shown Moses. Do you think that took faith on these guys part? Yes, absolutely. All right. And what's amazing is how well they did it. And it actually talks about, I think, over in Hebrews about how Moses was faithful in doing all of this. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. You're going to say something, Phil? Yeah, it is amazing. I, I, uh, um, it, it's really extraordinary. I, but one of the things that I want to highlight is that it was a it was a complete work of the Lord, but it was their choice to embrace that which the Lord gave them to do and really embrace it fully, expecting in faith to be able to perform that which was given them to do. Yes, it was God's wisdom. Yes, it was of his ability working through. Him. Yes, it was all those things. But the key thing in there was a willing heart. And it, it really is amazing when I know my personal experience, when you embrace something fully that the Lord has given you, then you operate in a wisdom and you stand back in kind of awe because of what you have been able to accomplish in that situation, scenario, the workplace, whatever the case may be. Amen. Absolutely. And you know, and they're having to step out in faith in these things. They're not stepping out knowing what they're going to do or how they're going to do it. And it's a, uh, you know, this is the thing is the walk. If you're going to play it without faith, the scripture says it is impossible to please him. It's impossible. And what is man always trying to avoid? Faith. Because faith, if you step out, it's always, I mean, imagine this. Okay, let's just imagine this. Um, let's say, you know, Phil, you were whatever the guy is here who he'd put it in, Bezalel or whatever. Um, and he'd given you Edmund to help. And I'm over here telling you what to do. And you guys are working on it. And we know that, we're, that this has to be precisely in accordance with God, what God showed me. Now, bear in mind, uh, Phil's a cabinet maker. Edmund is a good carpenter. He knows how to do things. Me? Uh-uh. None of those things. 
And yet God moving through the three of us to accomplish this. And I shared, and these guys are going to be listening to me, and they're probably going to be thinking like so many people think, like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do it that way? Why? Because God's ways are higher than our ways. He's got a far better idea than our best idea. So he's got some idea that's great, but we can't see it until we get into it and start working with it. And then it's like, oh, wow, that's cool. Right. I mean, that's so often how it works out, but you got to yield to it. You got to embrace it for as it's laid out in order to experience that. If you don't, you're always you're left with your own idea and you never get to partake of God's. And that's another key point is abandoning your own understanding. And as you go and embrace the thing, um, it is neat because it is talking about building something. So, you know, kind of have an experience of many times like you know a picture or something given to me being like i have never done anything like this before <laughs> and you know it would be thinking thinking i you know i lift it lift these things up to the lord and what happens is then it just starts laying out as i embrace it fully embrace the responsibility that no i'm going to build this thing and Lord, I lift this thing up. Lord, please give me wisdom to go forward. It's amazing how it just starts to just unfold as you stepping out. The steps just are rolling, and then you, you, it's a, it's a pretty. You amazing get excited experience. then. Yes, you do. You it, can't it, wait for the next step. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> you want to continue. I mean, the next thing you know, the end of the day is here. You're like, I don't want to stop, you know. But praise God, anyways. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to turn now over to Exodus 35 where I've asked Robin to go. So go ahead. Let's start with verse one there, Rob. But you got to turn your mic on. You probably got it muted. This is my sister's first day on a Zoom broadcast. First night. Oh, wait a second. I've seen you here before. You should know how to do this. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words which the Lord hath commanded that you should do them. Six days shall work. Shall work. Wait, stop a second. I thought that's where you're supposed to start. Let's Was see. it four? Oh, yeah, go ahead. You can. Well, go ahead and finish. You're all right. Sorry. Go ahead. Just read from there. Six days shall work be done but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day a sabbath of rest to the lord whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death you shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the sabbath day and moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of israel saying this is the commandment which this is the thing which the lord commanded saying take ye from among you an offering unto the lord Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. Stop right there. So I think right now we're seeing that I believe Moses's list is lining up perfectly with God's list. Okay, keep going. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Ah, so now we have the people coming forward in addition to the two he's given by name. All right, keep going. The tabernacle, his tent and his covering, his taches and his boards, his bars, his pillars, and his sockets, the ark and the stays thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table and his staves and all his vessels and the shoe bread, the candlestick also for the light and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light, and the incense altar and his staves and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen grate, 
his staves and all his vessels, the laver in his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets, and the hanging for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords, the cloth, cloths of service to do, it must be the clothes of service to do service in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. All right, so we'll stop right there. So now He's just outlined all the same things he said before that they were going to have to do and build. They're doing it now. What he did is he put this job out for bid, right? See, these are people coming forward of their own voluntary free will to do this. And it's amazing. Years ago, and if you're ever in Vermont, I encourage folks to go to this place. It's kind of an interesting place, and it harkens to a different era in America. Uh, president Calvin Coolidge, uh, who was president shortly before the Great Depression, he was originally from a small town in Vermont. And uh, he's famous, actually, in part, there's actually a famous painting because his father was a notary public. And he was vice president, and he got word that the president had died. Uh, he was, I think, President Harding's running mate. And so the president had died. And, you know, if you ever watch an inauguration, you always got the Supreme Court justice there and the president, you got all these witnesses. Well, all it is, is you take an oath. And uh, his father thought, well, I'm a notary public. And so he he took his son in his, in his father's house and he administered the oath of the office of the presidency by candlelight in his father's house right there in Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Uh, now, Calvin Coolidge had left Vermont and he had made his kind of fortune and fame in the Massachusetts area before he became vice president and then president. But he was actually visiting his father when he got the word and that's what happened. And when you go there at Plymouth Notch, um, they have some different buildings there that are kind of neat that harken back to his time. And one of them is the church building. It's a beautiful wood, wooden church church. Um, that was made and the craftsmanship of the work is really quite extraordinary. And what's so amazing about it, and as so many of the old kind of New England structures at any rate from back in like the 1800s and the like is it was extraordinarily well made and it was made by the people themselves. This was an offering of love of the people themselves unto the Lord and they did the work heartily as unto the Lord and not as unto men. You see the same thing in a lot of the old school buildings and things like this. They didn't put it out for bond and do all of these things like they do today. The people went and built it. The, the buildings would last 100 years with people still in there do, going to school. Sometimes 150 years. Now, every 20 years, we need a new one. And you got to do another bond and stuff. You wanted to say something? Uh, it's a question and so were the teachers though too weren't they all that volunteer as well teachers were usually were often paid for before you had public schools the teachers were often the ministers and he did it as just part of his ministry um but in the public schools they tended to provide for a teacher um that way and they would pay a teacher to come and teach their students but it was the parents who kind of called them of the community it's not like it is today but the point I wanted to make at is how beautiful that little old church was in a little nowhere place in Vermont called Plymouth Notch. And it was beautiful because the people of that community loved the Lord and did the work heartily as unto him. And it was better than their houses. It was beautifully done. And see, this is the thing. These people are coming forward of their own voluntary free will to join in this great endeavor. And it's a wonderful thing. Yes, Rick. You know, I'm going to jump down a couple verses because, you know, what we've been really learning through the offering is that it's more than just the stuff of the money. And that's like the, that's the least bit. The, the more acceptable offering is yourself. Uh, and you see in verse 21, it says, and they came everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing. 
And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all his service and for all his holy garments. You see, they came both men and women, as many as willing hearted brought grace. He just goes through and you just see the people giving not only of the stuff, but of themselves holy. And it's obvious that the Lord moved mightily through them in this and blessed them because of it. And it, go, it just goes, it just reiterates how more important it is to give of yourself. It's easy to give stuff. It's actually much easier to give stuff than it is to give yourself. The Lord wants you. You're going to say something. Pick up the microphone. No, absolutely, Rick. And, you know, it all comes down. You know, God's not a respecter of persons. He'll, he'll use anybody that's willing, of that willing heart, who wants to go after that. And um, you can see, for an example, you got Paul the Apostle and you had Peter. And, you know, you, Paul report of Peter, that which worked effectually in Peter, um, was mighty in Paul, the same yeah. ministry. So it was only effectual in Peter, but it was mighty in Paul. And it came down as, no, it, Peter was to be, it, to work mighty with Peter too. But Paul went after it the more, and that was manifested by his willingness to go after. And, you know, I just wanted to highlight that. So that, you know, you're, the, the only barrier that you have between going forward in the Lord and growing in the Lord and, and it is actually yourself. That's all it is. And is that what you want? <laughs> so. Amen. Amen. All right, Rob, uh, pick, pick up reading from 21 uh, as Rick was going, and I'll tell you when to stop. Okay. Did you want me to start? Okay. Start with 21. Well, where were we? You'd... Oh, no, you can start with 20 because okay. we'd read through 19. Go ahead. Start with 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all its service, and for the holy garments. And if I may, I wanted to point out that that's the person's spirit there. Um, just to make sure it's not confused, his spirit uh, made him willing. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one they did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was found Shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise hearted did spin with their hands and brought them, brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. Wait, did I just hear you saying something about women working? Isn't that prohibited? I've never noticed that. Oh, me neither. Okay, go on. I just wanted to make sure. And all the My women wife works pretty hard. <laughs> well, I bring it up because a lot of ideas people have had are actually not biblical ideas. They're man's ideas of biblical things, very different. So these women are, they are really working, okay, and making a real contribution to what is going on here. And I just wanted to bring it up. They are really of their own voluntary free will bringing offerings, not at the commandment of their husbands, but at their own decision. And I want people to see that. People think God is not somebody who puts people into bondage. He's a person. He's a God who sets people free. Yes, being a woman isn't a bondage. Right. So keep going. Um, and and all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work, which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand 
of Moses. You can keep Mo reading. I'm going to keep you reading all the way into the beginning of 36. So keep going. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in the cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of wood to make any manner of cunning work. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach of the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work of those that devise cunning work. Now stop right here. I wanted to hit one of the things you see here is a line of authority operating as well. First of all, you see God showed it to Moses, right? And then you see Moses. The, none of this is Moses's idea. There's not a single word you're reading here that is like Moses going, you know, and I know what we'll do. <laughs> this is entirely Moses doing what God told him to do and doing things in accordance with how God showed him. Even do it didn't matter what Moses thought of uh, Bezalel or Aholiab. That's who God had called by name. Now he has Bezalel first because Bezalel's over Aholiab. And then he names Aholiab, and then he names the people who are wise-hearted who come. In other words, everybody who came wanting to contribute and help in some way operated under Bezalel and Aholiab. And Aholiab operated under Bezalel. So you see a line of authority so everything can be done decently and in order and perfectly. God expected them to complete this test perfectly in accordance with the pattern that Moses had given. So, oh, can I bring, I got some red, um, I got some red horse hair. Can I bring that? No, will not be accepted. It was badger skins and this other thing and stuff like that. You bring what he said. That's what you bring. I got this really pretty topaz. It says onyx stones, but I love topaz. I don't care. Yeah, make a necklace, Phil said, for yourself, all right, but not for Aaron and his sons to wear. You, you follow what I'm saying? It did, he didn't ask everybody what their favorite things were. He told them what he wanted done, and he expected them to do it exactly as he told them. And this is a principle in Christ that almost nobody knows. It's like it's just gone completely out the door in the United States of America in particular. Yes, Phil. It's just like how Cain's sacrifice was not accepted and Abel's was. If you brought the things which was required according to God's plan and under that authority, that was acceptable. And the Lord blessed you and you grew in the Lord in that. If you did not, that would be unacceptable and you wouldn't be blessed and you wouldn't have the wisdom to even do it. Yeah, and it's not even saying that God doesn't like topaz, for example. It's not about that. It's this is what I want for this purpose. You can use topaz for all sorts of other things, but not for this. All right. And, and, and people get offended at this kind of stuff. Well, tough, get over yourself. I mean, who do you really think you are anyways? I mean, that's, I mean, are you here to instruct God? God created you so he could learn something new. That, there's something in, in scripture, I can't think of it, that exactly hits that point. Um, but I, I forget, I think it might, it be, might be Job. Now, if any man taking any thought can add one cubit to his stature or something like that, not that one. All right. Well, you're going to have to figure it out. I'm going to stop helping you. <laughs> you do apologize. Now, I, I'm saying apologies for Phil because he didn't do it on the microphone. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. Praise God. We love one another here. Having a good time. All right, Rob, keep reading out of 36. Then Rob. Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. 
And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. And they received of Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it withal. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning. And all the wise men that wrought all the work of the sanctuary came every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let every man nor let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Now, the rest of the chapter goes on about the making the different things. But think of that situation where a minister is actually telling people to stop giving versus what generally happens. Talk about a contrast. <laughs> right. I mean, that's a pretty extraordinary contrast. This is a people who at this moment in their walk um, were people who wanted to please the Lord. And you see it expressed in their giving in this situation and them rising up to join in the labor. And it's a wonderful, wonderful testimony of how things can and should work, really. I mean, if God wants something done, really, why would you not want to join in any way you can unto that? Um, I mean, I'll give you a small example. I'm going over to Ghana, and the Lord has been extraordinarily gracious on so many different fronts. Uh, but I mean, going to Ghana costs money. Um, there's provision. There's time away. There's a lot of different things, and different people are in different situations. Some people are in a position where they really don't have anything, say, financially to give. Um, there are people who have an ability to give financially, um, and there's different kinds of situations. But one thing every single person has the opportunity to give and actually is commanded to give by the Lord. I don't know whether you do it or not. But one thing that you're commanded to do is to pray. You know, do you, a lot of people, one of the things that happens, you know, when you see the person in charge, a lot of times people think, well, he's got that cover. I mean, that guy, he just always has everything covered. You know what I mean? They have no idea what it's like to be the one who has everything covered. Okay. If they had any idea what it was to be the one who has everything covered, they know you don't feel like you have anything covered at all. Um, but, you know, in the situation, people are caught up in their own problems and it's hard for them to give focus to something that may be going on with another. And I bring it up because it actually prayer in such matters is an offering of self. It's actually considering the things of others, considering the things that they are going through, considering what they may have need of, considering the people they're going to be coming into contact with, considering, look, I've never been to Ghana before. You know, I mean, I've never been to Ghana before. I know a few people in Ghana. Yes, Rick. A scripture that comes to mind when you're saying that, Steve, um, for, for anyone that says they don't have something to offer, Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. There is always opportunity. Amen. And so the thing is, is that in that, uh, you know, what's what's happening is it's kind of cool. I'll give you a small example. Um, Brother Lawrence's niece just recently completed her studies in the African Studies program at the University of Cape Coast. And in Ghana, after you complete your studies, you have to give a year of service to the nation. It's called National Service. And uh, she, her national service is being done in that department. And I told Lawrence, I said, hey, bro, I said, I want to meet um, some African scholars on slavery. Cape Coast has a big, two big slave castles there. 
Uh, it was also, I think, the center of um, colonial rule at one point in time. And this dates all the way back to the days of the Portuguese before Columbus even discovered America um, while they were inching their way down the coast. And I said, like, I want to meet some um, scholars on African scholars on slavery and things like that. I don't care what their background is. I don't care if they're Muslim. I don't care if they hate all white people. I don't care what their background is. I want to meet them. And so he talked to his niece, who she gave me four names. And now I'm being put up by these people. I'm going to be staying in their homes. They're setting up things for I'm going to be able to speak with students and do seminars and meet a whole bunch of different folks. And they're giving me reading lists of books that I should read and things like that to understand things from the African perspective. And I'm really excited, personally. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So Manuela, who doesn't even know me, she's probably heard my name from her uncle, you know, and who knows that he lived with me for a year and a half and stuff like that. She, her little thing of giving me four names has turned into a tremendous opportunity both for me to learn and grow in that way, but also hopefully to be able to share and interact with uh, people, not only in that circle, but also in various other parts of the country. Yes, Rick. You know, one thing that is not uh, missed on, uh, on me and anyone that knows you, and there are probably, there may be people hearing these things not uh, that wouldn't get it. S Steve has been sort of um, landlocked for the last 20 plus years. Um, and his heart's desire is to be able to do exactly what he's getting to do now. Uh, is, I mean, his desire has been to serve the Lord, but He's wanted to travel. He's wanted to go do things. He's wanted to engage in these ways. And he has offered the last however many years, I don't know how many years of this, Steve, a lot. More than 30. Uh, 30 years, has offered the last 30 years of service to the Lord, uh, much like you're seeing these guys here do uh, with Moses. And you see now 30 years in 30 plus years the lord not only just blessing steve mightily in many different ways uh with the family and with opportunities and so forth but also then to go and engage in something that really he's had a passion for uh before he even knew the lord he had a passion wrongly motivated um to be involved in these things but now with the Lord sort of adjusting him, took 30 plus years to be able to go do it. Um, it's very cool to see because for anyone that knows Steve, even a little bit, can almost feel it, the, the excitement and joy he has is somewhat palatable. Um, and it's very exciting for me to see him be able to go do this. So I, I just, you guys that may not know him, like I know him, just know this is huge for Steve and it is really the the it shows me and anyone that wants to see it the absolute goodness of the Lord to the towards those that give all of themselves to his service I just you know it's a huge thing um, I watch your emails as they come through Steve and I see your growing excitement even doing things that are outside your comfort zone like entertaining Android devices and such things. Um, there are many things that it's just very cool to see. Uh, and it, the fact that all of this is for the glory of God is why you're able to do it. Well, and what you see, if you really get down to it, it's pretty amazing um, that how as you lift, as I lifted things up to the Lord, how the Lord's opened up things. I'll give you a small example, folks don't know. I had been looking at I'd been thinking, you know what, I want to, I think I need to go to East Africa and travel perhaps overland with my boys and down to South Africa, which is quite the trip. I mean, most of you, well, probably few of you have ever traveled over land between poor countries. I, I've done it and it's a, a very different experience. Um, and it was funny, almost, it was almost like the week after I did, Brother Lawrence is getting in contact with ministers in Uganda. A week after that, 
a one of the ministers we've been working with in Kenya for about seven or eight years, all of a sudden gets back in touch and a bunch of different things start opening up. And it's then I get a call from these folks who are neighbors of Jones in South Africa and minister unto them. And they were really blessed and really hoping that I get to come over and see them and stuff like that. And you just see as the Lord then starts preparing the way for these kinds of things. And it's like, all right, cool. That's that works for me, Lord, you know, hallelujah. So, uh, you know, he's he is a good God. And you, you just if you serve him, he knows who you are. He knows how you are. And yeah, he may not give it to you today. I mean, because I can tell you 30 years ago when your dad used to say, hey, look, let me give you twenty dollars and I want you to go out and you got to come back with more and you come out with you go out with nothing but that twenty dollars. I was always like, send me, send me, send me, send me. And he was always like, no, no, you stay here. I'm going out on the road, Steve. Can I come? No, you stay here. Steve, I'm going down here. Can I come? No, you stay here. So I stayed in Vermont for 25 years, <laughs> which, I mean, look, I love Vermont. Don't get me wrong, folks. Um, but if you had known me, Vermont is not a place you'd have ever thought I'd go live. But uh, the Lord had me there for 25 years, and I learned a tremendous number of things being there. So it just embrace when you embrace what God has for you, you get what you get the fullness of the blessing he has. I mean, and there's nothing that compares. So that's really the offering of oneself. Yes, Phil, you were going to say something. Yeah. Well, I wanted to kind of go back to the scriptures we were reading. Ah, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what are those? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I can not to. <laughs> um, well, no, it's cool. I mean, you look at everything that they gave of a willing heart and what they did you know it's interesting in that is you know where did that come from well that came from the egyptians spoiling the israelites the israelites spoiling the egyptians forgive me i had that backwards thank you steve and so you see where it was the lord that provided that for them and then when they went of a willing heart and embraced the things to go build and to give it was then they were given the wisdom. Um, and you can see that everything that was provided was provided for the Lord. It reminds me of last, I think it was last week you were talking about the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof is that it all comes from the Lord. But it's in a great opportunity to be a part of what the Lord is doing. And that's essentially your excitement is you're, you've been a part of what the Lord's been doing. And now you're going over where you want to be. And that's a blessing to you and these kinds of things. But you can see where it just all comes from the Lord, what the people knew, the wisdom they had, uh, the vision that Moses uh, was given to Moses was given by the Lord. And everybody was a partaker of what the Lord had. And I can imagine that being a very, very joyful moment for those guys, because I know when I've embraced those things and been a partaker of some of those things myself on a personal level, not building tabernacle, but in other things has been some of the greatest joy I've ever had in those things. And so, um, and it's just like, man, you just feel fortunate and grateful that, man, I could actually be a partaker of what you have, Lord. That is awesome. That's an awesome thing. And, you know, you're just like joy unspeakable. I understand what that is. Um, and that opportunity is for, for all that want it, but it comes down to, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't force that, you know, it's a, a choice that you make. It's a great one. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's the choice that you make. And that's the thing. It's everything's of your free will. If you want the blessing, choose the Lord and choose to do what he says. So look, we're getting close to the hour. Um, Rick, I can think of two little things we could potentially do. One is, I could look uh, briefly at David and the children of Israel preparing for the temple, uh, which is similar to what we've just been hit. Or we could go over to the one you were looking at, which was in first, uh, uh, I forget where it's about Jehoiada the priest and King, King Jehoahash, I think there. Um, uh, yeah, it was over in uh, Second Kings. Second Kings. Where was that? Second Kings 12 or something like that? Yeah, Second Kings 12. Um, and you can start with verse one. And, and that was a different time, like we were discussing earlier. I mean, here we just had the children of Israel 
spoil the Egyptians. The Lord did a mighty miraculous thing. Pharaoh's destroyed. They're excited. They're happy. Everything's awesome. Um, and they're just willing of a willing heart giving. And here in second Kings, you're coming off a time that was pretty treacherous actually. And they had walked away from the Lord and things had fallen apart and the service of the Lord wasn't being done. And the priest, uh, we'll have to see, I believe it was um, Jehoiada. Um, things are brought back together. And in a similar way with the, you know, there was a willingness of the people to actually give. Um, and then it was then put to the proper places and the breaches were repaired and the, and the temple was repaired. But you see that um, they were called to bring an offering, and they did. And it was more out of their lack than out of their abundance, but they yet did. Yeah, the part that, for folks who don't know the context, what had happened after King Jehoshaphat, who had been very faithful, died. I think it was his son came next, and... Uh, or it might have been his grandson. It was one of the two. It might have been the grandson, and they, um, and he dies, and his mom was of the house of Ahab, who had been destroyed. Um, she was the one who was Jezebel, and, you know, and not a, she wasn't of Jezebel, but she was of, she was of Ahab's household, um, and they had turned the kingdom of Judah out of the way, and she'd killed all the seed royal after her son died. And the priest, the high priest, had saved one alive, a little boy, and kept him hidden in the temple with him. And then when he turned seven, he informed the people, revealed them, and his grandmother or whatever, whatever her relationship was to him, um, she had been running Judah, and he has her killed. She's crying out treason, treason, and the high priest has the men take her and put her to death and they put the young child on the throne and that's that's where you're at right now in first uh second kings 12 go ahead rick um so i'll just start verse one is that cool that's fine in the seventh year of jehu uh jehoahash began to reign Je jehoa jehoa jehoash uh, jehoash i think uh, jehoa anyway began to reign in 40 years reigned he in jerusalem and his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jeho Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. It's That's important because after Jehoiada dies, and he lived till he was 137, he lived long past the 120 years. And I believe the reason why he did was because it was needful yeah. for Israel, for him to live longer and keep things in order. But when he died, Jehoahash turned from following the Lord and killed his son when he prophesied evil to him. So he didn't continue all the way, but he's doing well here while Jehoiada is alive. Keep going. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. And Jehoash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passes the account, the money that every man is set at, and all the money that cometh into any man's heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priest take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, whosoever any, wheresoever any breach shall be found. But it was so that in the three and twentieth year of King Jehoash, Je, yeah, the priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. Then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada the priest. And the other priests and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now, there, now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches uh, of the house. And the priests consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bore a hole in the lid of it and set it aside the altar on the right side as one cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priests that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And when it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. 
And they gave the money being told into the hands of them that did the work and that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they laid it out to the carpenters and builders and wrought upon the house of the Lord and to masons and hewers of stone and to buy timber and huge stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. You want me to keep reading? Sure. Howbeit there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen, <clears throat> but they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen, for they dealt faithfully. I wanted to hit that last point. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't like to be accountable. And uh, they, they reject it. And most of it is because if they're going to be held accountable, they're going to be found wanting. Truth be told. But what was happening here is these workmen were faithful to the point that no accounting had to be done because it was obvious that they were faithful in these things. That should be the testimony of every servant of the Lord and whatever it is the Lord has given them. You know, you should be prepared at all times and desirous of and come to give an account for that which you do and that which you say and that which you operate in. But the beauty is, is that there comes a place where it becomes obvious that you're reliable. And things begin to change as a function of that. And uh, I just tell you folks because the idea the people who live openly and in an accountable way those aren't the ones you got to check on it's the ones who are always trying to hold back and not bring their things to the light those are the ones you do uh, but you see here the priesthood even though you had jehoiada had done these things the priesthood was not following what the king had said and basically this was the people here who were supposed to be fixing these things were levites they weren't priests they were Levites, but they weren't giving them the stuff to fix it. They're keeping it for themselves. You know, it's one of the things you see in ministries. Uh, and I know I've listened to it like I think it happens all over, but it's a common thing I hear amongst um, uh, many of the African ministers that Lawrence works with is there's the big minister, the big cheese, so to speak. And he's always promising the young ministers they're going to have this opportunity. They're going to have that opportunity and stuff like that. But when it comes down to it they keep it all themselves and when you do that you know you can, how, how are other people ever going to grow they're not you got to spring a leak in things i mean you know your father used to tell the story of he used it many times but he actually got it from another person who he heard preach it which was the difference you know the the river jordan in israel the the name the name the river jordan means the river of life and I've actually been to Israel and you see the River Jordan and flows out of you see it up in like the Golan Heights and what used to be Syria and the like, and it comes running down. And it's, you know, it's not a big river, but it's beautiful. It's clear water. It's nice and everything. And then it comes into the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is this place that there's fish in it. There's um, the water's beautiful. You can go jump in it, have a good time. There's villages and towns all around it and stuff like that. People grow crops and do different things um, in and around it. And then the river, the water flows out of it. It's still the River Jordan there. It flows out of the Sea of Galilee and it continues. And then it goes down to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea doesn't have any leak. The water comes in, but it doesn't ever leave. It's like the Hotel California that way. And what happens is, that it dies and everything around it dies it's a very desolate place and sadly that's often the case in churches is they become desolate places the church is supposed to be a flourishing place it's supposed to be a place of life where the where the words of life are spoken 
where the people's lives are transformed, where they come and by hearing the word are blessed in their every endeavor. That's what church is supposed to be. Freely you have received, freely give. And when the church operates like that, it grows. When the Christians in the church operate like that, the church grows because people want to be around them because they're ministering the word of life. You know, if you look back at the story of Ruth, one of the beauties of the story of Ruth, and you see it is actually the story of, um, uh, what was the, what was her the man's name that she ended up marrying? Boaz. Boaz, <laughs> Boaz right? Yeah, Boaz. <clears throat> now, Boaz was a wealthy man of Judah. And what you saw is when the workmen went off, what did they do? They began by praying the blessing of the Lord on them as they went in the work. And they prayed the blessing of the Lord upon one another when they got back. And he, he followed the law. The law said that you leave the corners of your field so that the poor people can get. And when he saw, heard that Ruth was there, and that she was Naomi's daughter-in-law. He said, look, let fall even out here where you're doing the work and let them follow and pick up there. He was being liberal in his giving unto her. And you see how he was blessed. You see the other man whose birthright it was to marry um, Ruth and to receive the blessing of that land. He would not do it because he considered it that his his inheritance would be marred in the process. And so he rejected the blessing of God. Boaz got it. And David came of that line, as did Jesus. I'd say Boaz was blessed. And I'd say the neighbor who was the one who had the higher, who had the first dibs, so to speak, on redeeming that, lost out big time. Christians lose out big time all the time because they're operating in their own understanding and missing the blessings that God has for them right there. And Boaz got them. Ruth got them. And that family got them because of their faith. And really, that's what it comes down to on these things with offerings. You know, look, folks, God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be blessed. He's not going to twist arms and force people to give that which they don't want to give. Not going to happen. Uh, that's why Paul talked about knowing how to be abased and how to abound. You know, whichever way he was, he was content because he wasn't going to be moved by all of that stuff. He was going to do what the Lord had for him to do. End of story. What people did was what people did. Wasn't going to stop him. But people could be blessed by joining with them in that. And there were people who were blessed because they did. The real question for you is, will you be blessed or will you not? I hope you'll choose the way of blessings. Amen. So you guys, before we call it a night, does anybody have something you want to share on these things? Um, I will say to those of you who are reading, I encourage you, I'm going to give you some things. I encourage you to read. Uh, you can just do this. I don't know if we're going to go through it when we pick this study back up, but I encourage you to go read 2 Samuel 6, 12 to 19, which is David's rejoicing in the offerings he's making when he's bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. You see him dancing before the Lord to the place where he exposed himself wonderful story there. You see in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 1 to 8, as David's at the end of his life, and he's making provision for the temple, and he talks of his son Solomon, who's yet young and tender and, uh, and not strong, and he's encouraging the people to join with him in this endeavor, and the people responded and joined with him in that endeavor to supply that which was necessary for what was going to be the temple of the Lord. That had been in David's heart to, to build, which was good, but it was going to be done by his son Solomon. And uh, so you see that. So these are two really good examples. I also encourage you to go read Nehemiah and Ezra, both of them, as far as talking about a difficult time, 
where the children of Israel out of their penury, in other words, out of their necessity, are sacrificing of themselves to see the temple rebuilt, to see the city of Jerusalem rebuilt. Uh, you see people doing everything from building the walls with a sword in one hand and working with the other and having a watch and they're too far separated that they're going to have a guy with a trumpet that can blow if the people come to fall on them and the like. You see them following the words of the prophets as they're running into what somebody might call zoning problems as their enemies are trying to stop the building of the temple and going back to the king and the prophets are encouraging them to continue on in the building of the temple notwithstanding the opposition. And you see the people giving willingly to the temple as it was established. All of these are things where people are in, in poverty and in need, but they're just so grateful that God is bringing them back in accordance with the promise he had given them through Jeremiah, that after 70 years of bondage, he would bring them back, that they took whatever they had and were willing to give of themselves. They were even willing to take voluntarily go dwell in Jerusalem so that there'd be people so that the city would not be taken even though there was a city exists because you have a prosperous countryside cities can't exist on their own they exist because of the prosperity of the country and the country was being developed but they chose to voluntarily go live in Jerusalem even in that poverty so that the city could be established that they wanted to, they were faithful in wanting to see God's promise come to pass. That's why there was a place for Jesus to go when he was born. And there were a people and there was a priesthood and there were the different things it was because of the sacrifices of people like that. Even though the temple of Jesus's day was not the same temple that had been built by them. So I share these things with you because you'll see in these stories of giving that are extraordinary stories of giving. And there we one subject we haven't touched on at all, which we'll pick up later, is the book, the story of alms. And alms are also an extremely important third component of giving on Christians, on Christians' part. And it can be both money and it can be deeds, it can be many different things. And so I want to encourage you guys to really prayerfully seek these things out that the fullness of the blessings of God can reside upon you and your household, because that's what God wants. And that the that the work of the ministry that he has for this body to do can be abundantly blessed. And that's really what this is all about, is that the work of the Lord ultimately gets done and the people of the Lord are being blessed by him what it's about so may the lord bless you we're not going to have a meeting next week because i'll be in transit stay tuned thereafter because we may have some different things with brother lawrence and others and may the lord bless you signing off good night good night